it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 144 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too, don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we have returned to the French roast. It's good. It has notes of cocoa, toasted sugar, and raspberry. Raspberries are Ella's favorite. She would like this, maybe. Oh no, I'm drinking it all. (laughs) And where can everybody find this coffee? Bantamroasters.com. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious coffee with raspberries and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us in Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. How did it get to be the end of August? How are you doing? Great. August flew by. Where did it go? I don't don't know. (laughs) It's gone. Can you tell me? Where did the last 50 years go? I don't, I don't know. know. Where is August? I need a leash on these months so I can hold them That's closer. a novel idea. I slow time down just a little bit. The next time bit. like, there's a month that's dragging about like February, I'm going to be like, you need to take the leash off. Ella started back at school yesterday. Ooh. Where does the summer go? Well, you know, when we were kids back in the dark ages, we did not go back to school until after Labor Day. Right. And one of those reasons why was because of the state fair and most of us were 4-H kids. That's, and we were still doing the state fair. And the state makes a lot of money off of travel. Oh, yeah, yeah. That last vacation weekend. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It makes a difference. And with the state fair here in Maryland the last two weeks of the summer, like you said, 4-H, plus that state fair brought in lots of revenue for a lot of people. Absolutely. So, they pushed it back. Now, when Sophia first started school, they were still going after Labor Day. Then they switched. Then they were going before Labor Day. And for the last, I'd say, five plus years, Harford County was going after Labor Day. And then this year, they switched back. Mm. So now Sophia doesn't start school until after Labor Day. That's college, yeah. Yeah. But Ella, poor little kid, she's back in school. I'm telling you what. I, don't, I do not envy them. Not before Labor Day. Mm-mm. Not before Labor Day. Well, we hated school anyway. <laughs> oh, we had a grand old time. But we hated Every minute of being in the school. <laughs> yeah. If we're being honest, we did. I mean, before there were phones, there were notes, and we wrote a million of them. We must have looked like we were taking notes or doing something important because we, we were very rarely bothered by anyone about our note writing. Oh, yeah. And the poor boy who sat between us in all of our classes, because it usually was a boy that would sit between us, and he'd have to pass our notes back and forth. Oh, in John, physics. Yeah. In physics. I can't remember his last name, but John, you had to pass our notes a lot of the time. Yeah. So what else is August going on? August 29th. Uh-huh. And my anniversary is the 31st. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to me. How many years? 26. Yeah. So. hmm Yes, but we've been together 31. We've been, we're old people now. Mm-hmm. We're old. So, yeah. It always seems so new. Like you and Joe had been together for more than 20 years and Pete and I had only been together for a few. Well, we're coming up on 10 years. Yeah, it's crazy. It, it goes fast. It goes fast, yeah. Yeah, so. been together 31. Not sure what we're doing yet. I'm sure there's going to be some surprise for some me. Some kind of big plan. Maybe. Okay. I'm not sure. A piece of jewelry. Ooh, that would be nice. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how are things on your end? They're great. Things are quiet. We're just still working around the house. The other day, so I've been growing cabbage because I love me some cabbage. The other day, I was cutting one up to saute it. And Pete said, oh, are you making coleslaw? And I thought, I've never made coleslaw from my own cabbage. So I did. Oh, my God, was it good. And then when you go outside, take a big old bowl of that coleslaw and look at the bunnies and say, this is one you didn't get. (laughs) (laughs) The bunnies, the ants, everything, everything around is feasting on my salad and veggies. One cabbage made it. You're like, I'm going to make a coleslaw. I actually got more than half of the cabbage out of that batch. I thought they were going to be gone, but I left them in the ground and they kept growing. So, yeah. 
Yeah, that's They crazy. might not have been the prettiest, but they were delicious. I still think the animals get that they're on a restaurant schedule of people's houses for gardens and no trees and everything doubt. else. No doubt. We're at the DiCarlo's at their peach trees today. Mm. Yeah, different stuff. But that's cool. Did you like it? Was it good? Oh, it was the best coleslaw I've ever had. Seriously. That's great. That fresh cabbage is amazing. Now, on that note, mm-hmm. if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. We love to read these. And let me tell you, if you leave us a written review, it puts a smile on our face. We absolutely love them. While you're there, hit that subscribe button. Two things, you never miss an episode, and it's another really easy way to help us grow. If you're looking for other ways to help support the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell a few chicken-loving friends about the podcast. One million. I feel feel like we've had a lot of of word-of-mouth referral lately, so that's fantastic. Thank Thank you you so much. You can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the merchandise we have there. We have mugs. We have t-shirts, tank tops, and we have our new little chickens up there. They're there. You can become a patron of the show. Visit patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. You can check out our levels of membership, see if that's something you would like to do. Mm -hmm. You want to have a happy hour? with us once a month. Let's do it. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website and or our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order, and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery. Defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Going to Ikea, Ikea, Ikea. It's time for the Breed Spotlight, yeah! That is quite a jump. (laughs) I did not know what you were going... Yeah, okay, wow. You surprised me with that one. I hope everyone gets this really bad joke. This week's Breed Spotlight is the Swedish flower hen. The Swedish flower (laughs) hen. Oh my lord. And the reason I did that introduction is because my girls are redoing their bedroom. So we have been to Ikea 20 times in the past month. No No exaggeration. I still love me some Ikea. I never get tired of Ikea. We were one of the first cities on the East Coast to have an Ikea. And we take it for granted because there are people out there that drive like hour to two hours to go to Ikea. Two different occasions, Pete's mom has come down to visit us so that we could go eat lunch and walk around Ikea. I know. For for real. And it's probably 12 minutes from my house. It's a little farther from me, but I need to make that pilgrimage at least a couple times a year. From here, you would be 12 minutes. And Love me some Ikea. We have no live in there 20 times because the girls are redoing their bedrooms. So Swedish, Swedish hen, I had to get Ikea in there. Great home goods, great (laughs) chickens. Some of the best chickens. Okay, so let's talk the Swedish flower. 
hen. The beautiful Swedish flower hen is a heritage land race breed from Sweden. You will often hear them referred to as the largest of the Swedish breeds. They are. They're considered rare in their home country. They're considered rare in the rest of Europe, and they are definitely rare in the U.S. as well. But they are becoming really popular. If you look across social media, there's a lot of people inquiring about there the Swedish flower hens. There are definitely more of them. Yeah, I, I do. I agree that they're becoming more popular. And they're fabulous birds. They're smart. They're healthy. They're hardy. They're active chickens. They have that beautiful name. They're named for the gorgeous spots of color on their feathers. Right. So it's supposed to look like, you know, a field of flowers in bloom. They kind of are like the speckled Sussex, but of different coloring. Right, right. They have a lot more variety. I think that, well, they're not divas. Like these are like practical earthy chickens. I don't know. Some of yours have been divas. Who was a diva? I'm trying to think who it was. Is Pansy a diva? Pansy's not a diva, no. Pansy Pansy does whatever Pansy wants. Pansy is not above a fight in the chicken yard if she has to. <laughs> They're really Although she does like the way she she likes it the way it is. And she's like, I'm gonna do what it takes. Yeah. She, yeah. They're she's, strong chickens. They're very strong chickens. They are. They are not APA recognized. They're not considered an American heritage breed, so they're not on the livestock conservancy's conservation priority list. Right, because they're European. They're undoubtedly a heritage breed, but they just weren't used traditionally in the US. No. I've never found any evidence that they were here before the last couple of decades. And people want them for their beauty. Right. The fact is, genetically, they're a very strong heritage breed chicken. Very. So their beauty is another check mark on their list of why you should have them. Yeah. But they are a very strong chicken. They so. really are. So Swedish flower hens, Swedish flowers are always referred to as Swedish flower hens. Even the ruse. Their Swedish name has hen in it. So- you would say you have a Swedish flower hen and a Swedish flower hen rooster. Right. I don't bother with that because I'm lazy. So they become Swedish flowers. Yeah. But technically speaking correctly, and just watch saying this in front of serious breeders. Oh, this you could be another thing we get in trouble for. Swedish flower hen rooster. And they're speckling or modeling or whatever. Their speckles really look like flowers, and that's where mm -hmm. the flower comes from. Yeah, yeah. They're an older breed. They're at least, at least a few hundred years old. Because they're a land race breed, farmers and chicken keepers let them roam together and choose their own mates. So there's not a lot of like, you can get one that looks, they can be siblings and look a million times different. They can. They can really look different. Allowing them to essentially self-select, really let them evolve into a breed that thrives in Swedish weather and in that geography. Right. Their story was the usual. They were replaced by hybrid layers and they were practically extinct by the 1970s. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so conservation is set out to find out what was left of the Swedish flowers. And they were lucky enough to find three different flocks out in the countryside. Okay. So those birds were the start of the conservation breeding. And they're the foundation for all of the modern flower hens. There's three flocks. Now, here's a name that you always hear us talking about. It's going to come out of our mouth and it's Green Fire Farms because this farm has done amazing things for European heritage breeds. Mm -hmm. And there is no different with the Swedish flower hen. Right. They did import them in in 2012, and they have a beautiful breeding flock. All of my, well, I don't have that many left. All of my Swedish flowers that I've had over the years have been from Greenfriar stock. Right. They don't have a standard appearance. Like we said, they're usually very, very colorful birds. Yeah, like if you look up Swedish flower hens and you go to images on Google, you're going to see white birds with gold and brown or amber birds mm -hmm. or golden birds with speckles or wine colored birds with speckles. Now, the common thread between all of them is they're speckling. Right, right. Hens have beautiful black or white spots on the end of their feathers. And like we said, they're the flowers. They're the flowers. Roosters have spots too, though, not as many. But the roosters tend to be, I mean, drop dead Casper. gorgeous and colorful. Yeah. My yeah. We're going to have to this week put another picture of Casper, Casper up because he is a Swedish flower hen rooster. And we've gotten lots of compliments on our page. He's a stunner. With his coloring. He's very beautiful. And the roos tend to have blocking in different colors versus yeah. the speckles. Like this will be burgundy and this will be gold right. and this will be black with white spots. You can find Swedish flower hens. In all kinds of shades of brown, black, white, blue-gray, cream, 
and red. So and, that's what we were saying. And like it's honestly, pl- it's a plethora. Even variations of them, you could probably come out with all kind. You know, if you're going to do a really tight color wheel, you could come out with all different shades. Right. So I mean, it's one. You know, I call it the grab bag. You don't know what you're going to get. So <laughs> that's kind of the fun. Swedish you, flowers are like a box of chocolates. It's like a, it's like a box of Swedish flower heads. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to get. So let's go into <laughs> their moderately sized straight combs. They're moderate. I'm not sure we're getting in there. <laughs> They're moderately sized. <laughs> <laughs> but they can be big on the roosters. I mean, Casper has a good sized comb. Yeah, and models. if you look up the pictures, the roos have bigger combs mm-hmm. also. The hens can also be crested, but not always. And that's part of that grab bag man- mentality, Dana grab bag. That's the store we yeah. used to go to and get the grab bags when we were younger. When Greenfire imported, they did get some hens with the crest, and that is a Swedish flower possibility. I mean, right. that's one of the reasons I love lamb race breeds of all types. Right. Like my beloved Hog Island sheep, the female sheep can sometimes have horns, sometimes not. Right. So I kind of like that fun. It's the surprise of it. You don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, and if you're getting, you know, one day old chick, what will that chicken evolve into? Right. And you're, it's kind of like, even with kids, you're like, are they going to look like me or are they going to look like mm-hmm. So it, it's with your chickens, it's a little bit an element of surprise. Yeah. So they also have red earlobes that turn half white and often, but not always, have yellow legs. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love those chickens with yellow legs. They were always paler yellow legs on my girls. And everybody, as chickens age, those yellow legs fade. Right. So we had a question about this a while ago about how do the you, age of how chickens. Do you guess a chickens age, right? And it's really difficult because chickens age like fine wine, like we do. You can't tell how old they are, really. Chickens age like fine wine. They never look different. They just will slow down on egg production, and those legs will fade. And it's difficult there because you could look at a Swedish flower and say her legs are pale yellow. She must be older. But no, she may have hatched with pale yellow legs. Unless you know from the start. And it's the same with some of the other breeds, yeah. So let's look in at weights. Hens usually weigh in around five pounds. Roos can reach six to seven. They're in that medium category. Mm-hmm. They're not in the large. They're not in the small. They're right in the middle. They're just right. Just right. So they would be good to add to your homestead. They're pretty good layers of cream colored eggs. I love their eggs. I love them. So are they some darker and lighter that you see or? Yeah. And I will say the pansies eggs have gotten lighter with time. She used to lay a darker cream and hers are pretty light. Right. Bluebell always laid a white egg. Right. The other girls all lay shades of cream. Nice. So three to four eggs a week when they're young and then about three as they age. They often lay into old age, even if it's only like two eggs a week. So pansy's seven now. Right. And she's still giving us two to three small white eggs per week. And they're good winter layers, which is great. Yeah, yeah. They will very rarely go broody. I mean, it's not unheard of. It happens, but I wouldn't count on it. You know, sometimes I've noticed in all of our breed spotlights and and going through and looking at all these chickens, a lot of the strong bred chickens are least amount to go broody. Uh Uh-huh. If you think about it, they're like, I'm an independent woman. I'm not sitting on any eggs. It does happen. I'm going to do my thing. (laughs) I don't have time for this. And then you have chickens like... The Favaroles and the Orpingtons that are like, come here, little darling, you know, and Mm -hmm. they're the the broody ones. So it's kind of fascinating to see the personalities coincide with the broody. I've never had a Swedish flower go broody, but my neighbor Kitty, who breeds them, she's had some broodies. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You just never know. You never know what you're going to get. It's true. You just don't. So they're amazing homestead chickens. That's what I said before. They are smart. I cannot emphasize enough how smart these chickens are. They are smart. They are very healthy. They are some of the best foragers ever. I have seen my Swedish flower hens leap into the air and catch bugs in midair. Yeah. They will turn over a compost pile in record speed, and I'm not exaggerating. They will spread mulch for you. They will eat ant eggs. They will eat insect pests. They're essentially pretty close to perfect additions to a permaculture system. They are. That's the part. And they're friendly with people. Yes. They're very friendly with people. They've got tons of personality. I mean, they're hilarious. They don't like to cuddle, but they do like to be around you. And the other thing is, they can be a little hard when it comes to mixed flocks. Yeah. So you're right. They don't like to cuddle. Like I said, they have a ton of personality. They like to hang out with their people. They love to be around you and they love to have your attention. But if there is any downside to them, it would be the fact that they can be 
dictators right. in a mixed flock. In a mixed flock, they're going to have to be the top chicken or there could be some wobbles like- over. I'm just going by watching you and your flocks. Yours have been very strong chicken personalities in your flock. I feel like because they are so strong and they're so confident, they do like to be at the top of the pecking order. And so I think that they need to live with either other assertive and outgoing breeds, or if you're integrating them into an existing flock, you're probably fine as long as you don't have anyone who's like a total doormat chicken. Right. And that's kind of what happened with the Morans, Mm -hmm. with the Warpingtons. They were integrated into a flock that had... Warpingtons and Americanas. Mm -hmm. So they found – now, they went up against the Americanas because they were in the middle of the line. Right. But I kind of feel like the Morans and the Swedish flower hens have the same type of personality. They're going to jockey for that head position. And that's where you could have some problems with mixed flocks. If they're oldest and already in charge, I personally would not push over chickens in with them. Right. Because that's what I did. Now, did you notice that they mothered them or they kind of tried to beat them up a little bit? I tried to beat them up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For, and this is from very early on. Yeah. So if you have some benevolent hens in charge and you bring the Swedish flowers in so they're not the oldest and they're not in charge, it probably goes better. Right. Roosters are usually pretty mellow and friendly. Every now and again, I've seen an aggressive Swedish flower rooster, but usually not. I mean, I'm just seeing a flock of Swedish flower hens, Morans, Barb Rocks, all these chickens, some wine dots all in together and just... Nobody th- sitting on eggs. I think that was right. <laughs> Nobody's brooding. And everybody's like, look, I'm doing my thing. I got to get to work. I think okay? a flock like that would work as long as the Swedish flowers were raised with them. Yeah. Because if you bring them into too big a group of strong chickens, then they can be pushed to the bottom. Oh, yeah. So it's a balancing act, you know? It's a balancing act. I think every flock is a balancing act. It really kind is. Of seeing it. Sometimes you don't know how it's going to go. And you could have that exception where yeah. a chicken doesn't follow through yep. what the personality really should be. Pansy is, she's always been in charge. Her seconds in command who have unfortunately left the world. I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing. Bluebell and Petunia were merciless bullies. I, I mean, love Bluebell. Bluebell is stunning. She's I a love beauty. Her. She came to my house yeah. multiple times. She is a beautiful, beautiful hand. I mean, she, I would say she's the prettiest Swedish flower I've ever seen. Yeah. I miss those girls a lot, but they were merciless bullies. I will definitely at some point get more Swedish flowers. They will probably have their own coop and run. Right. They are beautiful. They are practical. And they're reasonably hardy in both heat and cold. Which is good. But, you know, the combs you're going to have to protect with the cozy coop heater. Absolutely. Or bring them in. Yeah, I agree with you, the cozy coop heater, because those combs can get frostbitten quickly. Now that Pansy's a senior hen... As an older girl, she definitely appreciates that cozy coop heater to keep her warm on the coldest nights. I have noticed that in the last two years that she feels the cold a lot more than she did. Yeah. And going back to mixed flock Mm -hmm. and how they do with it, Mm -hmm. this is my overall take. And this is just my opinion sometimes that sometimes if you have a stronger breed chicken, like the Morans, like the Wyandots, like the Swedish flower hens, sometimes they do better in not a mixed flock where it's just a mm-hmm. flock, like you said, all themselves. I would put wine dots and Swedish flowers together. I think they would work. But there is something to say for a flock of just one breed. Absolutely. It's beautiful. They're beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yep. They're all the same breed. And it's like they do naturally flock, pardon the pun, together. Well, if you decide you want to breed them and you yeah. have you know, you know a nice group with a roo, then you don't have to worry about figuring out parentage or anything like that. You right. know you've got purebred Swedish flowers. Right. Yeah. So it would be beautiful to have that. Absolutely. So let's tell everybody, if you want to try this with a mixed flock or with a whatever flock, where are you going to go? If you want straight from the source, which is what I would do, uh, go to Greenfire Farms. We always tell you to go there because they're the best. They're my, awesome. My pet chicken also carries them. Now, Bluebell came from my pet chicken. Yeah. There are lots of small breeders out there around the country, though. I've heard lots of people say, hey, I've got a neighbor who breeds them. You can also check in with the Swedish Flower Breeders groups on Facebook. Last I checked, there were a couple different groups. I'm sure either one of them have people who would sell. Or Google. Google is your friend. Google is your friend. Okay. So here we go. If you have the Swedish Flower head, we want to see your pictures. Send them. Oh, we do. Tag us, or what it does is an Instagram. Mention us in your story. And then it gets sent over to us, and then we will give you an automatic share onto our story. We want to see your chickens. We're sure they're beautiful. 
If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well-made, and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 Okay, so this week's main topic, we're talking about growing and using herbs with your poultry. Now, we're not talking about essential oils here. We're talking about just simply herbs. Right. You're the chicken nurse. Yes, and I am. you, I really feel confident when I say there aren't too many people out there that nurse the way you do. I mean, <laughs> I'm seriously. I'm obsessive. But you know, you get the job done. Oh, yeah. And you know, we have Dr. Rebecca for doing the medical side. So, and I've been interested in herbalism for a long time, probably since I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia back in 2012. Right. So recently I decided to do some coursework and get some training. Right. Because we wanted another facet for this. Right. So I did a botanical medicine course with the University of Minnesota. And I'm currently doing some medicine making courses with Commonwealth Herbal out of Boston, Massachusetts. Can we call you Dr. Quinn now? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> medicine woman. So, Dr. Quinn, so here's the, the herbal thing, medicine woman. Here's the thing you need to know about herbalism. <laughs> herbalism is not licensed by anyone in the U.S. You're rogue. You're rogue. <laughs> you're, not, you're not really rogue, but you are not a doctor. If I'm talking about herbs on this podcast, I'm not giving you medical advice. I'm talking about herbalism. This is for education and entertainment purposes only. So not only can you add these to your spaghetti, but you can help your chickens with them you also. You can. You can. So, And there's some of the easiest and most useful things that you can grow. Like if you want to get into gardening... I mean, herb-wise, here's the thing. You can get into all these different weird, strange herbs that are great for some things, but I think every herb garden should have the essentials. Oregano, Dr. Quinn, tell us what the essentials are. <laughs> thyme, rosemary, the essentials that you use for everything first. Well, there's no denying that they have a lot of both culinary properties and medicinal properties. Oh, yeah. I've probably switched to growing... I do still grow veg, especially greens, but I think most of what I grow now is herbs and other things like garlic and onion, like flavoring things right. that are also medicinal. Right. You can, of course, if you don't want to grow your own stuff, there's nothing wrong with that. You can buy cut herbs at the grocery store. Farmer's or the farm. market. You can make your life super easy that way. Or you, you can go to the grocery store and buy the pot and sometimes. put it in your windowsill mm -hmm. and grow it as you use it. And just keep going. And if you want to, you can, if you have the means to plant them outside, you can plant them in a pot or a garden. Right. You can also grow these things from seed. It's pretty easy. It really is. It's a little more work that way, but it gets you a lot more plants for a lot less money. Yeah. And just to let you know that most herbs, they're not going to do great in shade. Mint is kind of the exception. Mint does really well in the shade. There are a handful that do well in the shade, but on average... They don't really do great. They need about four to six hours of sun. Mm -hmm. Some of them even more. Like basil likes all the sun it can get. It's so crazy though because the mint, they're in my shade gardens mm -hmm. and they grow like crazy. Oh, yeah. Like, it's almost they impossible like it. to kill mint. I know. I know. <laughs> you can plant mint anywhere. It loves it. Using botanical medicines can be very worthwhile and it can have great results for both people and animals. But a lot of care has to be taken when it comes to diagnosing and dosing your poultry, as well as carefully choosing the form of herbal concoction you're giving to your birds. Because herbal medicines don't work like pharmaceuticals. You're not usually just giving medicine once or twice a day. You may be administering doses several times throughout the day. And if you're a working person, that's not going to be mm -hmm. easy. At, that's why we say sometimes 
when you have things, medical problems, it's best to go with medicine first. Pharmaceutical medicine. Right. right. Pharmaceutical medicine. And this is the, the line we're going to take with herbal versus medical is there's a world where we can all be together in this. There's a, the midline right. where they can work together. Right. And part of what we're going to be talking about is knowing what to use when. There's an herbalist. Oh, what's his name? John McDonald. Is his name John McDonald? Did he have a farm? Yeah, I think he did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he says, he, he was talking about one of my favorite herbs, which is plantain. It's a weed. But he's like, you can use plantain for bee stings and it really helps. It takes the sting out. It mm-hmm. helps, you know, has antimicrobial properties. But if you have an anaphylactic reaction to bees, carry an EpiPen and some Benadryl. Yeah, there's nothing that's going to stop you that the a, way that a pharmaceutical, yeah. conventional medicine does. Exactly. So this is to work in conjunction with other things that can help you. Even if you're only able to dose an animal several times a day, with herbal medicines, they work best when the body and all the systems are functioning well, especially liver and kidneys. That's because that's how they're getting processed. That's right. So those things have to be working. So really, if you're interested in using herbal medicine with your poultry, our best advice is start with one or two plants and learn everything you can about them. Right. And the simple plants. That's kind of where I'm going back to this. Well, Oregano is a really good one to start out with. We're not going to talk about oregano today. But it's a good one to start It's a very good one to start off with. But I've got six other ones that you don't really hear about so much. We'll get to them. We you can't will, go wrong with oregano. But you can't go wrong with oregano. You really Just can't. know that. And it's super easy to grow. It is. So a lot of times, botanical medicines, herbs, can be beneficial in different forms. For example, you can eat the plant fresh. You can steep them in tea mm-hmm. and drink them. And a lot of times, that's the best way to do it. It is by far the best and easiest. And we're going to talk a lot more about tea in a few minutes And you here. can dry them. And you can make tinctures and salves out of them. Yeah. Herbs have constituents. These are their medical properties, and they help you figure out the best way to use them. So you'll often hear herbalists use terms like vulnerary, demulcent, astringent, or nervine. Okay. Vulnerary means it helps tissues heal. Okay. Demulcent, it's moistening. Okay. Astringent. It's cleaning. It's drying. And drying. And nervine, it's helping you calm down. Like lavender and chamomile are nervines. 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 I need some. Oh, seriously. I'm <laughs> Are ho- you saying I'm hyped? No, I'm saying we can both <laughs> use some chamomile tea sometimes. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but we drink coffee, so we're always hyped up on caffeine. <laughs> caffeine doesn't bother me. I can drink coffee before bed and I'm still at like a rock. Me too. But, I mean, it doesn't stop me from sleeping, but it does. I do feel a little jolt of, from the caffeine, no doubt. A little wound up. Okay, so we're going to give you quickly our general rules to follow for we're botanicals. Gonna, we're just going to name these going along. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start. If you don't know what it is, don't use it. This is I, the most simple rule it ever. It sounds totally logical and like who would do that, but you'll be surprised. Like don't eat the wild mushrooms in your yard. Right. Because you don't know exactly what yeah, they Unless are. you know for sure, don't do it. <laughs> if you're using a tincture for your poultry, it must be a glycerite and should not be alcohol-based. Alcohol-based tinctures will can damage the liver and can kill your chickens. And that is not good. No, no. In glycerin, it's more sugars. Right, exactly. It's vegetable sugars. So. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Herbs need to be used early and often. And this is sometimes you, you're you going to need to be able to see a chicken sick before they're sick. Okay? Right. Starting a bird on an herbal remedy when it's an acute health problem is often not a successful endeavor because they're already past the point where the herbs are going to help them. Right. Okay. So the best course of action in this case is to use a pharmaceutical treatment, go to the veterinarian, and also provide the herbal health support. Yeah, if you want to add some herbs in. So if you want to add the herbs in to help do that, but generally the veterinarian is the place to go when you're right. way past the beginning point. I'm sure there are. I've heard some very, very skilled herbalists that that have taken serious things like, you know, a rattlesnake bite and brought that animal back. Damn. But that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there is an herbal, he's a veterinarian too, though. He's a veterinarian and herbal. I mean, he got bitten by a rattlesnake? No, a dog did. Oh, man. Yeah. But, you know, again, if you're not Dr. Jones or you don't have Dr. Jones treating your animals, you might want a conventional treatment for that I rattlesnake bite. I can only imagine bite. what Dr. Jones looks like. Like I'll show them to you. Does he wear all khaki, like with the safari hat on? Like that's how I picture him. I don't think so. <laughs> that's how I picture okay. him. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Always do your own research and keep notes on exactly what you do that works or does not work. Unless you're like me and you have Holly Ann, 
then Holly Ann does all my research. If you could see my face right now, <laughs> for heaven's sake. <laughs> It's She's getting great. her revenge for the fact that I used to copy homework from some of the science stuff. <laughs> yep. You I'm, did my artwork and you took my science homework. Oh, that's right. I don't, you don't we, need we revenge. Did, we did a flip. We did do a flip. We did. We did. So what's what am I getting out of this? If- <laughs> it's just fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's move on. Essential oils need to be diluted into a carrier oil or diffused in some other way in their purest form. They are caustic and can burn your chicken skin, mouth, or any part of the body. Yeah, throat, whatever. Whatever. And it's also difficult to know the strength of the essential oil at that point. Right. There can be a million variables. They could be the harvest isn't as good this year. You know, they don't have as much essential oil for whatever reason. Here's the thing. It's part of this rule. Don't ever go into TJ Maxx into the essential oils department and buy an essential oil and well, just pour it out it and might give it to be, your chicken. It might not be culinary grade anyway. Uh, yeah. You have to – it's almost like you have to be in chemistry again and you have to mix it into something mm-hmm. and know exactly what it is. And that's why we always say go with the companies that do the scientific research already. They take that guesswork out for you. Yeah. I really recommend that you're working with fresh or dried plants and not I wouldn't even or- attempt essential oils at this point. I wouldn't either. And I don't like them as much, honestly. The stories that I've read about uh, – Let's just take, for instance, people using peppermint. Mm -hmm. It can burn or it danger skin anywhere. Well, even if you're using it topically, I mean, I've burned my own skin with oil of oregano. Yeah. It's it's no joke. It's not good. So stick with fresh or dry. If you're growing or foraging, make sure you don't use plants that have been sprayed with pesticides. Yes. Only plant food that's fed to them that's organic and healthy and natural you don't want to spray it with something and then feed it to your chickens. Oh, heck no. So don't, I mean, you don't want to, if you're foraging and wildcrafting, you really want to make sure this, and I'm being serious about this. If you're picking plantain, make sure a dog hasn't peed on it. <laughs> make sure it's not on the side of a road where it's like getting covered with car exhaust. Yeah. Awful. Seriously. Seriously. Okay. Now here's one of my most favorites. <laughs> one of your most favorite things? <laughs> one here. It's the last one. Yes. And we're going to talk about this in a main topic at some point down the road. In a dedicated episode. Yes. So herbal deworming. Okay. Yeah. Too much to fit here. Way too much. Way too much. (laughs) We could probably probably write a book on just that. I'm going to tell you just a slight little story from the other day. And I'm flipping through Facebook, just on my own personal page, looking at people's vacation pictures, hitting some likes, doing this, doing that. And up comes this post. On one of the chicken groups that says, what are these? And it's a group of roundworms. Ah. Yeah. And what can we do to help this chicken? And Or what are these? And everyone's saying, give cayenne pepper, give pumpkin seeds, give this. And I'm like, go to the vet and get some safeguard or go to Amazon and get some safeguard. Right. TSC. It's just too much. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. So we're going to go through our top six herbs pretty quickly. As always, you can email us or message us if you need anything. So these are... Not the common ones you always hear everyone regurgitating about using for your chicken. Oregano. Right. So the first one is yarrow. Yarrow. Achillea millifolium. Millifolium. Mm. Yarrow is awesome because you can use both wild yarrow and cultivated yarrow. Now, if you're using wild, be certain you ID it correctly. Yeah, definitely. There's apps for that out there. Yeah. Now, dried, this is really nifty. Dried, it can be used as a gentle blood stop powder. Nice. You can just powder the leaves and the flowers. Grind them up. And put them on a nail? Yeah, you can put them on a nail. You can put them on a bloody comb, anything like that. That's cool. You can also use it in salves for use on skin. Nice. It has a lot of... So if you have like coconut oil, you can add it to some coconut oil. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a vulnerary, so it helps with tissue healing and it helps with the blood stopping. Okay, so let's move on to plantain. Holly Ann's been using this one a lot throughout the episode. Plantain is my love. Plantago (laughs) She really loves it. It's considered a weed, okay? It grows everywhere. But especially likes crappy soil around driveways and sidewalks. It loves compacted crappy soil. It does. Another so, reason I love it. So this is one of her favorites. And it can be used both externally and internally. In- internally planting. Internally, right. You can brew it into a tea. You can. I really like it for a lot of skin applications, especially bumblefoot. Oh, Lord. It's also good for respiratory health. So you can make a soak out of it. You can make a strong tea with it. And put it in one of your little cups yeah. and soak a foot in it. Yeah. Using this after you go to the vet and you get antibiotics, it could all, everything can help. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. 
The thing with herbs is you need to know what you're doing as far as using the right plants. Right. But then if you're using the correct plants in moderate amounts, there's almost no side effect. It's hard to go wrong with them. Exactly. So you can do teas for plantain. You can put it in your phlox water, like brew a cup of tea. Right. That can help with respiratory health. It has antimicrobial properties. It has moistening properties. It has tissue healing properties. Nice. Now, with tissue healing, it works a little more slowly. And it has strong drawing powers, like drawing infection out, things like that. So I really like it. Mash it up into a paste. I nice. use it on Bumblefoot. Uh, you could probably put it with some baking soda and water. You probably could. And make a paste out of it. And you don't even need to put the baking soda if you don't want to. If you're just going to put it on Bumblefoot, you can traditionally you chew it. You make a spit poultice. Yeah, I'm not doing if that. If you're trying to be a little more hygienic, use a mortar and pestle with a drop of water and just pack it on there. It oh. does an awesome job. Okay, Plantain. So let's move on to purple coneflower. Sorry, I took Holly Ann's. I don't care. Go ahead. But I love these. They're some of my favorite flowers. are all over our property. Echinacea purpurea. Yeah, I never say echinacea. I always say cone flowers. That's why I put purple. I can't say it. That's why I Because it's the purple. I can't say purple cone flower. (laughs) So the thing with purple cone flower is that there are study after study after study on them. Of chickens eating them and them being Mm -hmm. beneficial. It helps build and support immune systems. And in some studies, it helped with healing in cases of E. coli and coccidiosis. Wow. And some respiratory problems. You know, it's one of those things that even after they die, I never cut them down until the spring when they're – because the birds eat them. Everybody eats them dry, everything. They're so beneficial to everybody out there. So, you know, you can feed the chickens. They they tend to like the petals, the seeds. They're all good stuff for these chickens. The petals and seeds are really, really potent, so they're fantastic. Next one is cilantro. Some people love it. Some people hate it. But it does have some beneficial well, things to it. cilantro is on my radar right now because cilantro is a very powerful heavy metal chelator. Okay, which you would need. So right now- What if you could soak it in your water bowl, just put the leaves in the water? I've thrown it out for them to eat. Yeah. I have made tea out of it in the water. And I have two individuals, two individuals, two people, two yeah. hens, who- have some lingering issues. So I actually ordered, I didn't make it myself because I don't have any glycerites, but I ordered a glycerite-based cilantro tincture. Okay. We're going to do some work with that and see how it goes. Going to tinker with it. We're going to tinker with the tincture. <laughs> Tink- <laughs> yeah, tinker sure. with the tincture. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. Rosemary, one of my favorites. They're shown to be great with heat stress. With chickens. Yeah, there are a couple studies that have shown promise helping poultry with heat stress. It's also antimicrobial. Yeah. You can do a million things with rosemary. I like just putting my fresh herbs in the water to soak and then they get the benefits from them. You can. You can just throw them in there cold and that would be like a long cold infusion. I'm going, I'm doing a cold brew. You can also literally make it into a cup of tea and then and dump cool it in it there. And then put it in. Some of the essential oils come out more easily when it's warm. When it's warm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The last one. One of my absolute favorites Me too. of all time. This, even more than oregano, I think this herb is a powerhouse of healing. Now, I grow a lot of this around my property and especially right in front of the chickens and they're always eating it. And it is? Thyme. Thyme is vulgaris. Thyme is excellent for overall health. It also helps with heat stress in conjunction with rosemary. You can use both of them. Right. You can feed the plant. You can feed just the leaves. The other thing you could do for heat stress is put them in ice cubes and then give them the ice cubes. You can. I mean, you can think of ways that you can use the fresh herbs. This is what we're talking about, fresh herbs. You can also brew a tea. Thyme is one that you need hot if you want the essential oils. This is a little trick I learned from Commonwealth Herbs. You want as much of the volatile oils as possible. So when you brew a hot tea, cover it. Okay. You can just put a napkin on top of it, a paper towel. Keep the steam in there. And that helps keep the oils in. You'll see the surface of the tea looks oily. Yeah. So those are just some of the not so run of the mill herbs. And then there's oregano, which we'll talk about later. Everyone talks about oregano. I feel like oregano is so overdone. It's overdone. It's just easy to grow. It's out there. And it's great. And it's great. All these things are great things that you can start to kind of play with that aren't really bad for them in any way. And you can't really do too much you know, to hurt. But I will say this, essential oils have to be made into another, like you said. Don't use them in their raw form, essentially. Do not. Do not. Okay. So this was just something that we're touching base on and we're going to talk way more about in the Mm -hmm. future and ongoing. So let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, as we were brainstorming, this came out, this recipe. And we brainstorm these recipes. We go back and forth 
Okay, what food do we want to use this week for a recipe? This is so good. And I threw out tater tots. It's tater tot nests with baked eggs and salsa. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. It's easy to make. It looks super cute. And it would really be great for brunch. It would be great for a girl's brunch. Yeah. Have your bestie over. Talk chickens. Kids might like it too. It's going to be a good kid dish. Definitely. And good for school starting. Okay. So let's talk about you need a bag of tater tots, <laughs> six large eggs, a cup of mixed vegetables, diced small. Cooked. And they need to be cooked, as yeah. Holly Ann said. A half a cup of shredded cheese, or if you're in my household, like the bag, a jar of salsa. In my household, the entire jar is going. <laughs> or fresh salsa, salt and pepper, some chive, cilantro to garnish. And these are easy. So easy. So easy. Preheat your oven to 400. You're going to grease or spray a standard size muffin tin. Although you could, you could do one whole quiche with this. You could do one big pie yeah. pan, but the, the glory of this is to make everybody it's their the own. the minis, yeah. And make the minis. So you're going to drop four or five tater tots into each muffin cup and just bake them like that for 15 or 20 minutes. You're going to take it out of the oven, use like a spoon, a shot glass would And you're going to crush them. Like mash the tots into a crush shape so you're lining the top yes. and bottom of each cup. And at this point, you want to turn the oven temperature down to 350. You're going to break your eggs into a mixing bowl and add a splash of milk or dairy-free milk. Beat them together. So they're blended. You're going to add the veggies and the Whatever cheese you like. and any other additions that you like. Carefully pour that filling into each tot crust. And you're going to bake them until they set, 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. And there you go. It's simple, easy. You can use your muffin tins, make 12 of them at a time, and enjoy. You just want to allow, when you take them out of the oven, you probably want to let them cool for a few minutes before you take them out. And you could garnish the top of these if you're serving them for a brunch with a little bit of pepper or something on well, top. Yeah. Once they're, I didn't put the salsa on right away. I let them yeah. cool a little bit, then put the salsa and the chives on. Yep. But you're right. You could throw some sour cream. You can make black olives. Yeah. You can make them look so fancy and they're so easy. Yeah. And the tater tot is the crust. It's great. It's great. Okay. So try it. You might like it and mm -hmm. let us know what you think. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're super, super excited about. The Murray Fest Midwest. Yeah. So this is going to be next year, the weekend before 4th of July. June 29th through July 1st of 2024, McMurray Hatchery, the best hatchery ever, is throwing the McMurray Fest. And it is essentially all about keeping poultry and homesteading. And, and it's a great day. It's going to be a great few days. The speakers are amazing, if I do say so myself. And we will be there. We will be speaking, and then we will be hanging out in the, and I quote unquote, bougie coffee tent. Bougie coffee tent. Yes, to meet everybody and drink coffee and talk chickens. We want everybody to come out and come meet us and talk chickens with us. This is what we've been waiting for. We want to meet y'all. I believe you can buy chicks too. You can buy chicks on Monday. On That's the Monday. What, on mm -hmm. the Monday, there will be chicks for sale that day and there will be a coffee truck there. And this is one of our going to be one of our favorite things to do. And we're talking and we're going to it's going to be such a great time. Yeah, our talk, I'm not sure what our talk is yet. Do we know? Yeah, I'm not sure. But that's okay. And this is going to be held at the fairgrounds. Yes, in Webster, Webster City, City, Iowa. And right now there's the website up and you can go on, you can buy tickets, you can plan your trip mm -hmm. with the hotels around town. And there's yeah. lots to do in Webster City. I'm pretty sure that Ginger has reserved hotels, like blocks of hotels, so you get a discount. I think so. If you want to book early. Right. So I have a feeling this thing is going to have a lot of people. I can't wait. I'm super excited. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just to go and meet everybody and talk chicken. So let's get through the speakers fun. real quick. So you, us. There's us. Tom Watkins, CEO and president of Murray McMurray Hatchery. Go ahead. And Aseta Scott, a farm girl in the making, if you follow her great stuff. Yes. Anne Briggs, you might know her as Anne of All Trades. Yes. She's amazing. She builds stuff. She grows stuff. She's fantastic. Jess and Jeremiah Sowards, you may know them from Roots and Refuge. They're amazing. YouTube channel. And then the final speaker is Daniel Salatin representing Polyface Farms to talk about all things homesteading. And then the coffee with the chicken ladies. So we will be there and we will be talking and we cannot wait. 
We looked up, because we're super excited about our trip next June, what can you do in Webster City? It turns out there's a whole lot you can do. There's a whole lot you can do. One thing we looked up, there's a Scooter's Cafe that serves some coffee in town. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going to be there. I even found a place, the Seneca Street Saloon. They've got gluten-free pizza. And margaritas. How can you go wrong? I'm just going to stay there the whole time. Okay, so they have the Monarch Butterfly Mural where you can go and get your selfies and your pictures done with some butterfly wings. That's that fun. sounds cool. Uh huh. There's a place we're going to be, no doubt, when we have some free time, the J&B Antique Store in town. Oh, you know that. They better stock up on their chicken stuff. <laughs> You're going to have some extra room in your suitcase for when we travel home. Extra room in the suitcase? I'm going to bring an extra suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another place you could find us, the Backcountry Winery. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, That's in Webster City. There's also a distillery. Yes. And they make corn whiskey. Nice. It's corn. There's also the Boone River Trail and Bridge. And there was something I found really interesting. It's the Barn Quilt Driving Tour. That's fun. That's a whole weekend of stuff. Plus. Plus, you're going to be at the fairgrounds. The whole weekend. To speakers. Mm -hmm. And learning great might, stuff and meeting all these great people. You might need to come a couple of days extra. Yeah. That's what I was saying earlier. And if there was a VIP ticket as well. Where you get a tour of McMurray Hatchery. It's on the, well worth the it. The Monday. The Monday following the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it's great. amazing. It's mm -hmm. going to be so much fun. So do us a favor. We're going to have the link on our show notes. Look it up. See if you can be there because we want to meet you. Oh, we want to see everyone. It's going to be super fun. And we're going to be broadcasting from there too at some point. We're going to be broadcasting from there and we're making a bingo card. Yeah. Come visit us. We can't wait. <laughs> a year away, but I'm still looking to see what I can wear. Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Okay, next week, our breed spotlight is a new one. We're going to talk about the Norfolk Greys. That's a UK breed. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Main topic, monthly roundtable with Fiona. We're talking molting. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay for Yay. Fiona. Not the other thing. Molting's molting. never fun. We'll give you all our tips and tricks. Cracking the eggs. We're doing my homemade coleslaw with <laughs> homemade mayonnaise. And it's homemade. It's all homemade. <laughs> it's good. And you can make it with packaged coleslaw if you want to. It's okay. It's all good. Retail Therapy, we're reviewing Molly Ye's new cookbook, Home is Where the Eggs Are. I'm sure there's going to be tons of great recipes in there. Seriously. We're going to be so hungry after talking about that book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.